Okay. Well, session 23, the temple and the two witnesses. Everybody got a, there's, there's handouts in case you want to take notes. For next time, we're going to talk uh, about the seventh trumpet, the woman and the dragon, the kingdom of the Antichrist and the false prophet. This is going to be a whirlwind session, so we need to start on time next week. All right, everybody understand that, what that means? Mm. What does that mean? Uh, Being here at 945. Yeah, or else you're going to be coming in and I'm going to be going. Because this is a lot, this is a big lesson. But if I'm going to hit my, uh, my schedule to get done on time, we've got to do it this way. Okay, so uh, we've already talked a lot about the Antichrist back in a previous session. So I'm going to be referring you back to that. And we're going to talk about the false prophet and the woman in the dragon. Uh, and also the seven trumpets. So read Revelation 12 and 13. Uh, the seven trumpets in the latter part of Revelation 11. So here we come to the uh, temple scene. And, and what this is is a pause. It, it's kind of an interjection, if you will. Uh, that's not necessarily a pause, but an interjection. It, it, imagine this as, as we're going through the narrative of the book of Revelation. And as you read things, sometimes you have parentheses that give you a little bit more information about something within the narrative, but not necessarily in chronological order. So here we have some more information. Think of this as a parenthesis. Uh, Revelation 11 starts off that, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it has been given over to the nations, if King James Version says to the Gentiles, and they will trample the holy city under for 42 months. So, there have been various temples in the scripture. We see several of them. Uh, the first one, of course, is the tabernacle, which we find in the Pentateuch. Uh, Moses was given instruction on exactly how to set up the, the tabernacle. We also have Solomon's temple. Now, who laid the groundwork for Solomon's temple? David, that is a great lesson for you guys. Because sometimes you may not be able to do the work yourself, but it doesn't mean that you can't lay groundwork and help and prepare the way for somebody to come after you and do it. Okay? So just because you can't do something yourself, don't necessarily think that God is not going to use you. It may be that his plan is to use someone else, for, and that is up to God how he does it. Then we have Zerubbabel's temple that we read about in Nehemiah and Ezra. Then we have Herod's, temp Herod's temple, which is commonly known as the second temple. Then we'll have the third temple, and this is the, the temple of the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 11. This is the third temple, known as the third temple. Then we'll have the millennial temple. Where do we see instructions on building the millennial temple? The temple of the thousand year reign of Christ. Where do we see that? What Old Testament book? Uh, game. game. <coughs> Ezekiel. Ezekiel. From chapter 40 on, it is instruction on what the temple will look like and what you will do. And Zechariah also touches on it a little bit in the later chapters. But it's how millennial worship will go. There's going to be a river flowing out of the temple. Um, you know, and it starts off ankle deep, and then it gets calf deep, then it's up to your knees, and it's up to your waist. There's trees along this river. The leaves are good for, uh, the, the, the trees are good for food, and the leaves are good for? Huh? Y'all got to read your Old Testament, guys. It's important. What are the leaves good for? For healing. They, they, the leaves somehow have some kind of a healing property, which is a debunking of the idea that Satan is the source of all sickness. Yes. Whenever you have humanity, you're going to have illness, even in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, it won't be as, as prevalent during the thousand-year reign of Christ. But you're still going to need people to go grab a leaf off of a tree and it's a, it's a thing of faith that this leaf will heal me. 
and, and whatever my ailment is. Because we know that in the millennial kingdom, that if you die at the age of 100, you're going to be considered accursed. In other words, you're a sinner. And so we need to also understand that our humanity is what causes us to sin. Not necessarily Satan tempting us to do it every time. It's our flesh. People will die outside of the faith during the thousand year reign of Christ, as crazy as that sounds. And matter of fact, as we get to the end of Revelation, you're going to see that at the end of the thousand years, the devil's going to be loose for a short season. He is going to be able to tempt a whole lot of people into rebelling against Christ. Even though that for a thousand years Jesus has been sitting on the throne and these people have witnessed it, they're still going to rebel against him. That boggles my mind, but it is what it is. And finally, we have the temple in heaven. Remember, when you read about the temple, it is real easy to take a look at the temple and the building of the temple, the building of the tabernacle. It's, it's real easy to take a look at those Old Testament verses in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and go, oh, this is so boring. But what you need to realize is that this is a mirror image of the tabernacle in heaven. So when you read about this, you need to realize that you're reading of an earthly representation of what is in heaven. Maybe that will help you see it a little differently. I know it helped me when I realized that what I'm reading in these mundane instructions is actually a representative of something that's in heaven. And the fun is trying to figure out why. Why do you have a hundred pomegranates? And why do you have a wash tub that's, you know, 18,000 gallons? Why? 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 That's called a great treasure hunt, right? That's where your treasure's built. Can I talk about the ark? Yep. Hold on. We'll get there. So, the temple. This is what we commonly know as Herod's temple, the second temple, the temple that the Romans destroyed in 70 AD. Now, we see we have the tab tabernacle and the temple. The Holy of Holies would have been right in here. There would have been a huge curtain that was about 60 feet tall and about two or three inches thick and about 30 feet wide. So that gives you, this is about 30 feet, this is about 60 feet. Um, how familiar with this was Jesus? Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specify here. Let's think back to Matthew chapter 4. What did the devil do? And one of the temptations of Christ. He took him up on the pinnacle of the temple. Okay, and, and, and then did what? Showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And, and all he had to do was, was fall down and worship him, right? Okay. Why did he do that? Why did Satan do that besides the obvious he wanted to tempt him? Because it was really high. I'm translating. Yeah. Why did Satan take him to the pinnacle of the temple? Oh, I think he said he wanted to be higher than God. Mm -mm. It's to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy that was not ready to be fulfilled. Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Mm -hmm. Who is that? The messenger? John. John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. What Satan was attempting to do when he took him to the highest part of the temple was he wanted him to basically jump off and descend down and come suddenly to the temple. Y'all get it? And therefore, bypass the cross. Satan was trying to get Jesus to fulfill Matthew, I mean Malachi 3. So he took him up to the very top here. Outside here you have what's known as the court of the Gentiles. So here's another view. Yes, sir. What people have to realize, Satan knows the word of God in and out. 
And that is correct. Tempts people to vote. He does. He will. He will quote scripture and he will make up things that uh, you might think are scripture. Right. Lord helps those who help himself. Right. To thine own self be true, which is Shakespeare, not scripture. That's what he did in the Garden of Eden. I've had somebody say that to me. Well, the Bible says to your own self be true. Like that. Shakespeare said that. So there is a good, here's a good illustration, a good 3D model. Uh, the pinnacle of the temple would have been right up in here. So at one point during Jesus' temptation, he was he and Satan were bodily standing up here. I've often wondered, did anybody see him? I don't know. Who are those two guys up there? Probably not. Probably not. Nope. But he wanted him to basically come suddenly, jump off, read it in Matthew 4, okay, mm -hmm. read the various temptations, come suddenly to the temple. And this would have, he would have jumped in here to the Holy of Holies where the priests were ministering, where the priests were offering, the daily priest was offering incense. Okay? So let's compare the temples. There's Herod's temple, and there's Solomon's temple. What do we know about Herod? That big old ego on that guy, right? That's a big old temple. But this is what Solomon's temple looked like. This is what uh, David would have uh, been wanting to prepare for. Uh, so here's a size comparison. There's a football field right here. This is Herod's temple. This is Solomon's temple. Okay. Notice that in Solomon's temple, there's no court of the Gentiles. That's important. Because what did we just read? When you measure it, leave out the court of the Gentiles. So what it seems to be referring to is a, is a, is a Herod-type temple, and we'll get into that in a second. But here's a representation. Earthly tabernacle, <coughs> heavenly tabernacle. Okay? The lever C, the lever C, the big bronze that had, you know, the sitting on. How many oxen was it sitting on? Seven. Negative. See, that's a good guess. <laughs> Twelve. For all, one for each tribe. Could have had it. Yeah. So, I was thinking 12. There's the C here, and then here's the heavenly C. In the multitudes, we have the throne. We, we see the seven lampstands, the book of Revelation, oh, that's here. Right. That's the altar of incense about. where the prayers are offered. <laughs> All right? And here are the multitudes that are before the throne. Okay? Surrounded by a cherubim. And we have uh, the elders running right the multitudes there. Okay? Now, let's talk about this idea of uh, what's, what's where the temple was right now. So they say. Uh, you, you, you don't get jumpy. <laughs> <laughs> on the rock. Dome of the rock. Dome of the rock. Or what? what is the uh, Arabic name? Mosque of Omar. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is, is there. Now, here is a representation. This is the plan of the Temple of Jupiter laid over Mount Hermon. Okay? Hadrian built a temple on top of, uh, sorry, Mount Moriah, not Mount Hermon. Mount Moriah. I see. I was looking at Hermon and I thought Hermon. <laughs> <laughs> so he built a temple on top of what he thought was the place of the temple that the, the Jews had torn down. Because see, Hadrian decided, uh, you know, we had another revolt going on around this time. And he said, you know, I've had enough of these guys. Right want to rebuild that temple. So I'm just going to build a temple to Jupiter on right on top of it. So when the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built, they put it right where Hadrian had put it. There's a problem. We built it in the wrong spot. So, let's look at it. 2 Samuel 24, 18, and, God, and Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go, rise up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of, of Aruna the Jebusite. Now, this is where they built the Dome of the Rock, was at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. That is where they thought it was. That is where Hadrian thought it was because they misread Scripture. It's really obvious, though, through Scripture that the 
the Holy of Holies was not put on the threshing floor of Aruna. Uh, and by the way, this passage in 2 Samuel is an awesome illustration of sacrifice. Because what David says there to Aruna, Aruna says, hey, I'll give it to you because you're going to use it for the Lord. You're going to build an altar for the Lord. I'm giving it to you. And, and David says, I'm not going to make a sacrifice to my Lord with something that costs me nothing. That's not a sacrifice. I'm going to buy it. So read that passage in 2 Samuel. It's a really, and, and, and read it deep and apply it to your life. Giving of your time, talents, and treasure is a sacrifice. If it's free, it's not a sacrifice. Okay, and that's what David is saying. 1 Chronicles 21.18 says, Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. They've got a couple of guys here. They have threshing floors right next to each other. So now, he wants to go to his neighbor. And the same thing happens. He buys the property. And then we see in 2 Chronicles 3.1, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. This is where Solomon built the temple. It is no, there's no discussion that Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. We know that. The problem is exactly where is it? Well, Let's look at this. This is, this is the Kidron Valley right here. Um, this would be Mount Moriah. And then we had a threshing floor. But what, it is, what happened is we actually had two threshing floors, not just one. David had built an altar, an altar first of all, when he was coming from Gilead uh, to offer sacrifices on Arunah's threshing floor. But to prepare the way for the temple, he built it right next to it on Ornan's threshing floor. Now, this is real important because when you look at Solomon's temple and Holy of Holies over the, the dome of the rock, what you see here is that the original Holy of Holies was out over here, not right here. Now, this is only 100 yards. It's not that big of a difference. But what that would do is place it... The, the Dome of the Rock over here, which is in where? The Court of the Gentiles, which is what? Revelation 11 says. So throughout church history and even early prophetic books in the, the 20th century, what we even in the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, who's a great prophecy teacher, what we see is all of this speculation that somehow in order for the Jews to rebuild their temple, which we know has to be there, because you can't, the, the Antichrist cannot go in and declare himself God in Matthew 24 unless there's a temple to go into. Right. So we know somehow they're going to have to rebuild their temple. So there's all this speculation out there of what happened to the Dome of the Rock. Somehow, if you're going to rebuild the temple, the dome can't be there. Well, maybe God takes it down by earthquake. Maybe war happens. Maybe the Jews take over and they destroy it. Maybe all of these speculations. Well, guess what? Modern archaeology has proven, especially just in the last 20 years, that they built it on the wrong spot. Because the Arabs did the exact same thing. They chose to put that rock there so the Jews could never come back and build the temple. But God is not mocked. God directs the hearts of men, and they put it in the wrong spot. Okay? So, the two witnesses... And I will grant authority over my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So I want to first look at these uh, half-week designations here. Uh, we see several different scriptures that point to the same length of time, but it calls them different things. The first one is a half of the week. Okay, and we see that in, these, in Daniel 27 and Revelation 12.4. So it's a half of the week of years. We see it listed as 1260 days. And then there's a speculation, is this 1260 days, where does this fall in the seven years? I believe it falls in the first half. Some people think second half, some people think right in the middle. I don't know. This is speculation. I believe it falls within the first half. 
Uh, we also see it called 42 months, which is in Revelation 11.2. That could be the second half. See, once again, we may not be going chronologically here. We see it called times, a time, times, and a dividing of time, which is strictly a time is a year, times is two years, a dividing of time is a half a year. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, it's all the same. And we also see it times, listed as times. Okay? All right. So, go back up. We see it called these two witnesses of mine. That is the way it reads in the Greek. Uh, it's an emphatic construction. Uh, and this Joshua says, I should have taken that out. That just, just cross that out because that was a note that I had and I took it out. Uh, two. Why two? Because it's the required number of witnesses before the law. You couldn't just have one person come and, and, and be a valid witness. You had to have two or more. Hence the reason why the church, the gathering of, of believers, where two or more are gathered, I am there in the midst of them. All right? That's a witness. It's a very important uh, construct of the scripture, of the witnessing. Remember, there's always two angels. At least two. We see two angels after the resurrection at the, at the tomb. Not one, two. All right? We had one witness run back and tell the men she wasn't believed. And then we had two witnesses go back and testify that he's gone, and then they believed him, except for one doubting Thomas. Uh, they're specifically called prophets. And in they're they, the, the prophets in the Old Testament sense. Um, and that they perform miracles. Now, the miracles are, are interesting. We'll look at that in a second. They speak, uh, they sit in sackcloth. Uh, that is a symbolic representation of law rather than grace. So, why that is important is because we now seem to be put back into, even though we're still saved by Jesus' blood, we're back to a different way of doing it. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that everything in this passage of Scripture speaks about the Old Testament. Things <coughs> you do not see New Testament; you see Old Testament. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. Now, this is interesting because in the Old Testament, this is what these two guys are called: Zerubbabel and Joshua. Uh, I believe that's in Zechariah yeah, Zechariah 4. Um, come on, wrong way. I want to read these real quick. Zechariah 4. This is a very interesting vision. Uh, Zechariah, the book of Zechariah is fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. It, I, I've got parts of chapter 5 of Zechariah that just blow my mind, and it's not really not that long. It's only, you know, what, uh, 11 verses long. But listen to this, uh, 10 through four, uh, 14. Uh, For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice, and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to them, What are these two olive trees on the right and to the left of the lampstand? And the second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, Lord. He said, These are the two appointed ones who stand by the Lord over the whole earth. And we know from chapter 3, when he has the vision of the high priest, that this is Joshua and Zerubbabel. All right. So this is why the Old Testament is important. So, I don't believe that these are the two guys that it's referring to. But what they are is they are like what they did. So if you want to understand more of what it means to be an olive tree and a lampstand, go back and read Zechariah. 
And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in the same manner be killed. You shoot at them, the bullet turns around and shoots you. You throw an RPG at them, the RPG round turns around and hits you. It's like a sci-fi movie. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So, that probably sounds familiar if you're familiar with your Old Testament, especially the, the book of Exodus and uh, the book of 1 Kings. Exodus is talking about Moses' works and Aaron's works and 1 Kings is talking about who? <clears throat> latter part of 1 Kings, who is, who is the prominent prophet? Elijah. So, we need to remember that according to John 1, 20 and, 1, and, and verse 21, three were expected. We expected a Messiah. Then they, 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 asked, they asked John, hey, who are you? He goes, I'm the one preparing the way. And they said, well, you are the one. He said, no, I'm the one preparing the way. And they said, are you Elijah? He said, no. Then they said, are you the prophet? We had three people that they were expecting. Well, we don't know exactly who that prophet is. But two ministries were unfinished. This is the general speculation is that it was Moses and Elijah. I will show you why I don't necessarily agree with that. Now, let me say, first of all, there is very little speculation that one of them is Elijah. That's almost universally understood amongst premillennialists that Elijah is one of the witnesses. No debate. The debate is over the other guy. Oh, no, I'm not. Okay. No. Sorry. So, uh, <coughs> we see a staff meeting. In Matthew 17, it's kind of like a staff meeting. You know, we've got three people getting together on the, on, on the mount there. Peter, James, and John are sitting there, and Peter's making some idiotic statements. Hey, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, let's build something. So, that's why I love Peter. Uh, and you can read in there, because he didn't know what to say. He was just, he was dumbfounded. He, so, he just started babbling. I do that. So, uh, we think maybe that this is another illustration. This is why Moses, we know they were Moses and Elijah. So this is an illustration of, or, or an example to, pointing to, hey, this is these two guys. All right. So, who are they? Uh, we, like I said, Elijah, he brought the fire from heaven, 1 Kings 18, 2 Kings 1, and we also see it in Jeremiah 5. Uh, remember, James and John wanted to duplicate Elijah's effort. When some people kind of got uppity against the ministry, they say, hey, Lord, why don't we just call fire down from heaven? You know, everybody's got this idea that John was, was this passive, loving, caring guy, and he was. Like, he wanted to torch people. Yeah, he was like, sons of thunder, right? Boerges, sons of thunder. Hey, God, let's just, we won't have no problems no more, right? Everybody obeyed then. Jesus is like, settle down, guys. Uh, Moses turned the water into blood and brought forth the plagues. But I want to say that there are alternative possibilities. Uh, the first one is Enoch. That's you. The first one was Enoch. Uh, because Enoch is a model of the rapture. And so was Elijah for that matter. Uh, there's a theory that he was born translated on the Feast of Shavuot. Uh, what is the Feast of Shavuot? What's another, what do we call it in, in Anglo terms? Not Passover. Christmas. No. Pentecost. Pentecost. Some people think it's John the Apostle. Why would they think it's John the Apostle? I told you the answer last night. <laughs> I'm glad you listened to me, brother. Well, no. <laughs> he was brainwashed by the football game. Yeah. Okay. Remember what Jesus says in John 21 when Peter says hey what about this guy oh no 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 I remember what you're talking okay. about okay Jesus says what about uh, Peter says what about him what about John because Peter's feeling a little uncomfortable because Jesus is is getting in his business right 
And Jesus said, if I want this guy to tarry until I come, what is that to you? And so what happened? There began a rumor that John would never die. Now, we believe John died, but we don't have any record of it. We have records of all the apostles dying but John. So I want to just pose that as a possible theory. Possible, not probable. I don't buy into it. But it's possible that John might have been raptured translated as well. And so if you have Elijah and John, you have a representation of the Old Testament and New Testament together as witnesses. I don't think that's possible. Anything possible. Yeah, but you know, okay. we went to the, in the beginning when he, was, when he said, oh, I'm not the one, I'm just preparing the way. That was John the Baptist. That's John the Baptist. John the Baptist, not, no, John, the Baptist. not John the Apostle, John the Baptist. So because John the Baptist came in the power of Elijah. Okay? Because remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said Elijah has come, and they did what they wanted to do with him. All right? I personally believe it's Elijah and Enoch. All right? Uh, we don't know a whole lot about Enoch, but the reason why I believe it's Elijah and Enoch, what did those two guys have in common? They didn't die. They never died. They're still alive somewhere. And, and they're not going to put on immortality like the church people because that's a one-time event. Hi. This is what happens when you do not replace your battery or if you do not ensure that there's a fresh battery in the camera before you start filming. So what I'm going to do is conclude the lesson, which was session 23. We left off speaking of the two witnesses and their identity. Namely, I believe it's Enoch and Elijah, the two men in the scripture that we know never died. They were both taken to heaven. As we get to Revelation 11, verses 7 through 11, we see that uh, the beast arises from the bottomless pit and kills them. We know from Revelation chapter 13 that that beast is the Antichrist. We also see that their dead bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem. And we know that they're going to be there for three and a half days. Now, this is a prophecy that could not have been fulfilled before our modern time. Everyone in the earth sees the two witnesses lying in the streets of Jerusalem. If we think back to the time when John wrote this particular book entitled Revelation, that was impossible. And also at that time, John had no awareness of the fact that there were people on the other side of the world. John did not know that there were people living in North America and South America at this time. He did not know that there was an Australia. By the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, people knew that there were people living all over the world. And I imagine as they looked at this prophecy, it probably confused them somewhat because how could people in North America be seeing the same thing that people in Africa were seeing or the same thing that people in South America were seeing? It was absolutely impossible to see these things. It was certainly impossible to see them all at once. But through the miracle of television and satellite television and CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and all of the news channels we have, we know that today broadcasts are done in an instant. We can watch them on our smartphones. So this is how this prophecy was fulfilled back in the 60s once we had satellites orbiting the earth and we were able to see real-time news events occurring. Um, in verse 10 we see a very interesting uh, event happening and that is everyone has a party and they're exchanging gifts. This is very common in the Islamic world when the elements of jihad achieve a great victory. We know that there were scenes of celebration at 9-11 uh, in, in, in Palestinian territory where people were handing out candy as a result of the 9-11 attacks. And in verse 10 here we see that everybody is exchanging presents. Now this could be an indication of what we've talked about in the past that the Antichrist and the, the system of the Antichrist is actually an Islamic type system. In the 
previous generations, uh, especially in the time of John, this was probably foreign that people would actually be so happy that people were killed. Now, people might be happy about it, but they would actually get out into the streets and celebrate. So this is a possible indication that this is Islamic in nature. And then we see that after three and a half days, a breath of life of God entered them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon all them who saw it. So after three and a half days, and verse 12 we see, that the Spirit says, come up here. And they went up into the cloud, and their enemies watched them. Now, this is the very same wording that is used in chapter 4, where Jesus says to John, come up here. Uh, it is a symbolic form of the rapture, where we are, we, we are gathered together in the clouds. And this is exactly what verse 12 says. And so that, to me, is symbolic of what... The rapture is, and is a type of personal rapture for these two witnesses who I again believe are Enoch and Elijah. Elijah is generally, as we said previously, is generally not disputed. The disputed is that other individual. Uh, most people will say it's either Moses or Enoch, and, and there are some other uh, possibilities. We see in verse 13 that at, at that hour, at the hour of their resurrection and ascension into heaven, there was a great earthquake that killed 7,000. And we notice there that a tenth of the city falls. This is interesting here in verse 13. It says, The rest were terrified and gave God glory. So the rest were scared out of their minds and they gave glory to the God of heaven is what it literally says. This could be the turning point in which the Jews finally recognize their Messiah. This could be the point where Romans 11.25 was fulfilled, where the scales fall off their eyes. And it could be that their attention had been on the Antichrist as their Messiah. And now they realize that no, he is the enemy. And this could explain his hatred for the Jews. Verse 14, it says, The second woe has passed. Behold, a third woe is to come soon. Uh, we need to understand that all of this was part of the previous time periods that ended in the sixth seal. That second woe is the sixth seal. So all of this is somehow contained within it. And it all is contained up to the sixth trumpet, which is the first half of the tribulation, uh, most believe. It is possible, I would say probable, that from the seventh trumpet on, this is the last half of the tribulation, and this is where we see the rise of the Antichrist. Next week, session 24, we'll be discussing the, the woman in the wilderness giving birth to the man-child, Revelation chapter 12. And then in Revelation 13, we will see the dragon and the false prophet arise out of the sea and out of the land, which are symbolic. And we will see the Jews, as we see in Revelation 12, we will see the Jewish people have to flee. And this is probably the point at which this happens when they give glory to God and they stop giving glory to the Antichrist. Again, I'm sorry for the battery, but I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. May God richly bless you.